So I'm Emily, and today we'll be talking about the reality of fashion microplastics in the ocean. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ghanaian Gahad nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojagi or Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future and our, our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So you might be wondering, what is our mission at CP3? So me, me and Miguel are part of CP3. CP3 stands for Concordia Precious Plastics. Our mission at CP3 is to reduce plastic waste at Concordia by repurposing it into new recycled items, just like in the picture here, where a plastic bottle is turned into a bench. In our case, we turn plastic bottles into earrings, for instance. So essentially, we foster upstream invention to reuse plastic waste, create experiential learning opportunities, and address the waste ga diversion gap in regards to plastic. So a little background about me. Um, so I'm a, essentially a supply chain and human resource management major, and I am the business coordinator at CP3. And so um, I'm Miguel. Hello, everyone. Um, and this is my life in the plastic research world. So um, while I was doing my undergrad at the University of Toronto, I was also doing research under the supervision of Dr. Chelsea Rockman. Um, and together, we published the first report of microplastic pollution in Lake Simcoe, which is a large inland lake in um, Ontario, for those of you that didn't know. Um, and so after finding out that these microplastics are in our fresh waters, I started to ask how it affected the organisms that actually live there. Um, so after I graduated, I decided to do my master's here at Concordia. Uh, and I'm currently studying the effects of microplastics um, on aquatic organisms. And right now I'm currently working on freshwater fish, specifically these convict cichlids that are originally found in Costa Rica. Uh, and I'm looking at how these contaminants that are pervasive around the world affect their development, their behavior, um, and especially their uh, cognitive ability. So um, if you follow us on um, Instagram, you might've seen um, the post about how they clear through the mazes. Um, so that's a reflection of their cog cognitive ability. And so in relation to my thesis, I'm also working with the fine folks over at CP3 um, to collect the microplastics that are uh, an inevitable product of their recycling process. So on here is what CP3 usually does. You know, we collect plastics and then we shred and clean it to create raw materials, which we turn into um, cool stuff. Uh, as I put on here, as Emily mentioned, now we turn into a bench or earrings or keychains, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, but where I specifically come in is um, as part of the Concordia Sustainability Ambassadors Program, I take these raw materials and I um, put it through a sieve and I collect the microplastics that are a product of their recycling process. And so I use these microplastics um, for my research um, or I package it so that other researchers can have a local source for research grade microplastics. Um, so these two photos here is what microplastics we collect from our original shredding process. And this is what it looks like under a microscope. So, so now we'll, yep. uh, thank you, Miguel. So what are microplastics? There's a common misconception that microplastic is one specific object, but it isn't. Microplastic is a catch-all term for a variety of unique chemical compounds. Microplastics are made from diverse molecules, have varying, varying molecule structures and come from products with various applications. For instance, microplastics can come from tires, textiles, and packaging. They can be found in multiple different sizes, shapes, and colors. When it comes to microplastics, we can simply consider them one contaminant. They are a diverse suite of contaminants. As a contaminant class, microplastics come from a large diversity of product types and are generally classified as either primary or secondary. Primary microplastics are manufactured to be less than five millimeters in size. They include pre-production pellets used to make plastic products. These pellets can be used to make multiple things such as 3D printing filaments. There are, this is where CP3 comes in. We reduce the need to make these primary microplastics by creating filaments from recycled plastics. 
Primary microplastics also include microbeads used in abrasives for industrial purposes or in personal care products. Thanks to the research of many plastic researchers, products with microbeads in them have recently become illegal. So now on to secondary microplastics. So secondary microplastics are small pieces of plastics, which are not produced intentionally, but instead are the result of the breakup and fragmentation of larger plastic via biological, physical, and chemical processes. Secondary microplastics can form during product use or released into the environment. In our case, the focus will be on secondary microplastics and not primary microplastics. So now on to shapes. Micro, uh, microplastics come in many shapes and colors. The shape of a microplastic is often used to assign it to a common category, which helps inform the source. To help with source appoint, appointment, we know that certain shapes are generally shed from different products. This provides clues related to where microplastics in, nat in nature may originate. So pellets are generally associated, associated with industrial feedstock, Spheres may be, come from microbes from personal care products or industrial scrubbers. Foam often comes from expanded polystyrene foam products such as insulation and food packaging. So frag fragments come from plastic toys or bottles and film, film often comes from plastic uh, bags. The last shape, which is uh, the focus of our webinar is uh, fibers and fiber bundles tend to shed from clothing, rope, or carpet. So now onto microfibers. So there's um, two types of uh, fibers. There are natural fibers and man-made fibers. So natural fibers include plant source and animal source. Plant source includes cotton, linen, rami, and animal source includes silk and wool. On the other side, there's man-made uh, fibers, which includes cellulosic source, which, which includes rayon acetate and triastate. And there's a chemical source, which includes acrylic, monoacrylic, nylon, polyester, olefin, rubber, and spandex. So generally, clothes is a mix of uh, both of these. It's not just one type of fiber, it's a mix. And now I'll uh, hand it over to Miguel. Yeah, so thanks, Emily. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, our clothes are a big source of fibers, and the two main ways that this gets to the environment are through shedding from normal use, um, you know, normal wear and tear, and through the washing cycle. So shedding is actually a pretty big problem in microplastic research, um, because a lot of contamination happens by us just working around and over our samples. Um, so, you know, if it's shedding through um, the friction when we handle stuff, it can get into our samples. So we often have to um, account for this when we publish papers to make sure that the values we report are not just from us contaminating our samples, but actually from what we find in the environment. Um, there are also things that we can do to help mitigate and minimize this um, shedding or contamination of our samples, like having air filtration and wearing clothes that we know are not plastic or strictly uh, um, natural. Um, and Speaking of that, clothes uh, do shed differentially depending on their build and their quality, but ultimately this kind of shedding from normal use is unavoidable. Um, so this is kind of an issue because once we release it out there, um, because it's so small and lightweight, it can get carried by the wind and dispersed through the air. And that's kind of how uh, the majority of the atmospheric microfibers are uh, dispersed. And so the other major input is through the washing cycle, as I mentioned, uh, which is a big source of fiber pollution in our waterways. Um, so these show up in wastewater treatment plants and other environments. Um, and so research actually shows that anywhere between 100 to 700,000 um, fibers shed per wash, per clothing item. Um, and so, you know, you multiply that with the amount of clothes that you wear on a, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you know, that ends up adding up into a lot of fibers that you shed per wash. Um, and so in this um, kind of webinar, we want to talk about um, ways to mitigate and reduce this input. But first, I want to talk about how or why this is bad for us. And so there's a lot of research that has looked at this issue in very many ways, um, which is a good thing. Um, so take this shirt here. Um, once we wear it, as I mentioned, and we put it through the laundry, we get fibers that ultimately end up in the environment. 
and we have very detailed um, models of how this can get into the environment. And there's also a lot of research that looked at different types of clothes and their different inputs in the environment. So we have a pretty good idea of specific inputs from specific types of garments, as well as the unique physical characteristics of fibers of certain types. And this is important because we need to take this into account when we try to come up with solutions to this problem. As you can imagine, you know, um, the weight, density, and even porosity, like the capability of these fibers to absorb things, can tell us a lot about how these fibers will disperse and impact our ecosystems, especially in our waters. Um, and so having all of this research is a very good thing, as I mentioned, but we still have more work to do in terms of actually um, using this research to affect policies and how our society not only views um, this problem, um, but also how we handle it in terms of uh, our daily lives. And so as I mentioned, we have a pretty good idea of the sources of these fibers and plastics in general and where they accumulate. Um, as shown here, we've linked domestic laundering to microfibers in the rivers, the oceans, um, even landfills. Um, and wastewater treatment plants. And ultimately, these fibers accumulate in those environments in what we call plastic sinks, um, where they can cause a variety of negative impacts on different levels of biological organization. And what I mean by that is we've seen impacts on their molecular and genetic level. You know, we've seen it alter how they produce proteins, how they produce enzymes that help in their daily functions. Uh, we've also seen it um, affect the whole organism um, in terms of their growth, their size, and their body shape. Um, and we have even seen that it has impacts on a community and population level. And this is kind of where it gets concerning. Um, so from a biologist standpoint, you know, the, when it can have drastic impacts on a community, that's when we should get worried because um, we as a society rely heavily on these um, ecosystems and these populations and so this means that it has far reaching impacts than just you know, an impact on one organism. And so when these fibers end up in the environment, they really, really get everywhere. Um, so we know that they can end up in aquatic and marine systems, as well as the atmosphere and even in terrestrial and agricultural spaces. And of course, as I alluded to before, it ends up in the organisms that live in those environments. Um, and the thing I always say to people is that virtually everywhere that we've looked for these microplastics, um, we've found them. So that to me alone is concerning. Um, and it's not surprising then that it is globally pervasive in our oceans. Um, and across the world, we're seeing significant input from fibers that are typically found in clothing. And so these uh, tags is normally what you would find in the back of your clothes. It tells you, you know, the makeup of the fibers in your clothes. And you would often find them made of uh, polyester, nylon, and acrylic. And these synthetic fibers actually are some of the most abundant plastic fibers found in nature. So your polyesters, your, acry your acrylics, your nylons, and your rayons. Um, those are the plastic fibers that we end up finding um, in our oceans. And so once in the ocean, these fibers um, are consumed by organisms. And we know that this can lead to a variety of effects, which are generally negative. But here I want to highlight that we have found microfibers in virtually every step of the marine food chain. So starting from algae to shrimp and other planktonic organisms like polyps, corals, crabs, um, and even to the fish and even apex predators like this Atlantic um, sharp-nosed shark. Um, and the fact that they're threatening these ecosystems should be enough for us to care. But I find with many things that uh, it's easier to make humans care when we can say how exactly this is affecting humans directly, right? So you might ask, so what, right? How does this affect me, a human individual? Well, we also know that these uh, microfibers have invaded our human spaces. You know, we know that um, microfibers are in our drinking water. It's in our atmosphere. It's in the air that we breathe. And as you would expect, it's also in the food that we eat. Um, given how polluted the environments are, um, you know, it makes sense that it gets into the organisms that we farm from these environments. And so whether or not we actually care that it's in our space is a whole different question entirely. Um, 
So here I wanted to highlight the different ways that microfibers can affect us both. Um, so both of these diagrams are well are from well-cited research papers, and they both say a lot of the same stuff. So don't be too scared of the a lot of figures here. Um, I'll break it down. So fibers can affect uh, organisms in two main ways, either physical or chemical. So some of the physical effects, like shown here in the gills and the intestine, um, they're really more relevant for smaller organisms um, because these fibers can actually cause blockages in these organs. And so, you know, in the gills, if the fibers accumulate in the gills, they can't um, pass water through them as effectively. Or in the intestine, they can't process um, food as well because, um, you know, there's certain blockages that prevent them from doing so. As well, they feel this um, satiation because they think they're full. Um, so maybe they won't eat as much and then that can cause a whole host of different problems. Um, but arguably, the more concerning pathway is the chemical one. Um, so as a product of the chemical composition of the fiber itself, um, which is what we call the intrinsic property here, um, that alone can have um, negative and potentially toxic effects. But going beyond that, these particles can act sort of like a vector for other marine pollutants. Um, so a good way to explain this is through this curry example. So I personally love curry a lot, but you know, but every now and then um, this sort of thing happens, uh, maybe not quite as extreme, but when it does, you know, this shirt will have the undeniable stench of the lovely herbs and spices of South Asia, right? So the curry stays in your shirt. So what happens here is the fibers of your shirt actually absorbs the curry in all of its glory. Um, and that's why it remains uh, that's why it retains the smell and sometimes the flavor still of your curry um, because the fibers have absorbed it. So in the same way, um, the fibers that we release into the environment um, can, be, uh, can absorb toxic pollutants that are already uh, there. And so this allows toxins to last longer in the environment because they have um, somewhere to sit and accumulate. Um, and they can also be carried um, farther than they normally would um, without this fiber as a vector. And so these toxins can be released once the organism ends up consuming these fibers. Um, and in terms of us humans, um, there is the possibility, um, although kind of small um, because of our large size, for some direct adverse health effects from us inhaling or consuming these particles. Um, one thing I'll say about that is we actually don't know too much about these direct consequences of inhaling or consuming these microfibers um, for humans, at least. Um, but I would argue even still that the indirect impacts um, of microplastics or microfibers pose a far greater issue for us as a society. So as I mentioned, fi fibers pose a threat to smaller organisms that are typically on the lower end of the food chain. But because of how interconnected these systems are, those effects can be seen on a much greater scale. So when these contaminants threaten the small guys, they also threaten the big guys, right? So when they threaten the health of the natural environments and ecosystems, they eventually will threaten us because they threaten our food source, they threaten the environments that we rely on so heavily. And so, so far we've talked about all of these synthetic or man-made fibers, um, but they're actually not the most pervasive out there. Um, in re reality, these natural fibers um, constitute the majority of the fibers you find in our oceans. So when I say natural fibers, you know, th that's your cottons, your wool, your, uh, you know, cellulosic fibers. Um, and to, to many people, this, finding is kind of surprising because we build up synthetic fibers as this like crazy thing that's so you know harmful for our environment but it's these natural fibers that are actually the more pervasive out there um, but that's not necessarily a good thing um, many people think that the solution to the microfiber issue is to just buy clothes that are made from natural fibers right um, but there's a general misconception that natural fibers are okay but that's not necessarily the case. So just because it's natural, just because it's cotton, just because it's cellulosic, that, that doesn't mean it's completely fine. 
Um, so here's something that always stuck with me. It's um, that cellulose in itself may not be bad, but the additives make these natural fibers bad. So if you think of cellulose, you know, um, it can come from plants and, you know, the shredding of like trees, you know, it's natural and it can eventually degrade. Um, but what makes it bad is when we start adding um, things to make it um, kind of more plastic and more um, make it last longer. So if you don't know too much about additives, here's a little crash course. So take this shirt here, you know, it's made up of fibers as we established. Um, but the fibers are um, rarely purely made from the polymer or the substance that they are. So in this case, it's a cellulosic fiber. It's not entirely cellulose or cotton that makes up this shirt. You know, we add dyes to give it color. We add additives or plasticizers to give it desir desirable qualities. And um, these additives actually turn the fibers to become more like their plastic counterparts. It makes them softer, more durable, more flexible but at the same time, it makes them behave like a plastic polymer, which is bad. You know, these dyes and additives can be carcinogenic, as this study found. They can be toxic to um, organisms. And the way that we process these natural fibers make them behave similarly to their counterparts, as I mentioned. And in turn, it causes the same amount of the destruction as synthetics. So it makes them have a longer lifespan, which means they don't degrade or biodegrade as readily in the environment, which was the whole purpose of having, having them be natural in the first place. Um, and it makes them have increased toxicity, which is obviously bad. And more importantly, um, it fools the consumers into buying these products um, in a large scale and marketing them as green. You know, So this is the same greenwashing technique that's so pervasive in our society. We've seen it in a bunch of different industries and the fashion industry is not you know free from this sin uh, we market a lot of things as natural and you know good for the environment but that's not always the case so these are the things that we kind of have to take into consideration when we're thinking about uh, potential solutions to this issue and so i'll give it over to you emily to talk about uh, solutions because I sh I, I'm assuming I've made a lot of people very sad with all these uh, bad things about microfibers. Thank you, Miguel. So uh, now onto solutions. So um, next slide. So there are multiple ways of producing uh, microfibers in the ocean. Despite how bad natural fibers, uh, natural fibers, despite how bad we make natural fibers sound, they still can, they, they are still the way to go. They just need to be less processed to not be as bad for the environment as synthetic fibers. Really, we want to choose like really plant-based and animal-based over man-made synthetics, like a spandex here. So the first solution we suggest is to use a colder washing setting. Higher temperatures can damage clothes more and release more fibers into the environment. Another solution is a uh, low size. You really want to fill up your, your washing machine more because when your machine is like half full, let's say, there's more fibers being released into the environment. Another solution is to use um, liquid soap instead of uh, powder, as powder tends to loosen more uh, fibers from clothing into the environment. Also, it's important to know that uh, CP3 does recycle these uh, containers as they are type two uh, containers. Uh, Another solution is uh, the coraball and the guppy, guppy friends. So uh, essentially the coraball is put into a dryer and it captures all the fibers from our clothing as it dries. Another alternative is the guppy friend. So as our clothing is washed, uh, fibers are caught by this uh, bag and not released into the environment. One real and viable solution are also laundry filters. So as seen in the image there, in the yellow image, these fi uh, filters essentially filter out fibers from washing machines. A study has been done in Ontario on these filters and here are the numbers. If a laundry filter were to become mandatory, 12 to 166 trillion microfibers would be captured every year in Toronto alone, thus diverted, diverted from our water sources. Also in Great Britain, there's a minister who has been pushing for this to become the law. So if Great Britain can have a minister pushing to make uh, this a law, so can Canada. 
this webinar is a step in the right direction by fostering an environment for sustainability for change to happen it needs to be on a political level just like in great britain so talking about um and going into webinars helps normalize this conversation as it becomes normalized normalized society would push for someone who cares about it just like in great britain essentially so um so now on to, uh, so um, I would, this is like a, the end. So, sorry. So essentially uh, CP3 will be having a, a raffle. Um, no one really needs to sign up for it. You're signed up for it through the forms and the winners will be announced on February 25th on social media. So if you want to follow us on social media, you'll be able to see if you win um, a keychain. Essentially, that's what it is. Uh, that looks like uh, this image. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that these um, are made from the process that we described before. Um, and it's made from 100% recycled HDP plastic. So we've turned, um, you know, plastic bottles and plastic caps into things like these, uh, which we're now going to be raffling to you guys. Um, and so if you're interested in doing kind of similar work, um, the Sustainability Ambassadors Program, which I am a part of, um, are now taking applications. Um, so if you're interested, go to concordia.ca uh, slash SSAP. And I believe Sarah has posted it on the chat as well. Um, and that's really it for, for us, for the main you know, talking portion, at least for us. Um, so we want to thank you guys um, for coming and we want to thank our sponsors. Um, and please follow us um, at these links. Um, if you want to learn more, um, there are the links. And if you have any questions, um, we're, we're here to answer them. Um, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much for this presentation. I definitely learned a lot. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sarah, by the way. I've been messaging everybody in the chat. Um, I'm gonna leave a couple seconds if anyone from our participants have any questions. Otherwise, I'll ask one of myself. Feel free to unmute yourself or you can post it in the chat and uh, ask Miguel or Emily directly. I was just wondering, um, it was a really good presentation, by the way. Um, the you offered like the Cora ball or a bee friend as a solution, but doesn't that just mean they don't go into water, they just go into other places? <laughs> yeah, so um, there is um, an issue there still. Um, so when it's we not, collect them, I know so it's I not simple, sorry. It's no, no, just... no, for sure. So I, we, I still have this issue, even with my research. So. Um, when I clean tanks or, you know, I clean stuff that had microplastics in them, I filter these plastics, but now I have, you know, a bucket just filled with microplastics that's sealed, you know, so there, um, our, our methods of collecting needs to improve for sure so that they don't, we don't release them into the environment, but there still is a lot of work done, as you pointed out, for, uh, for us to turn these microplastics that we collect into something that's actually usable. Um, and it's actually, you know, beneficial as opposed to just like sitting in a, you know, a bucket or a container of like microfibers that we're not using. Mm -hmm. Like, can you reuse those in any way? Um, in terms of research, uh, it really depends. Um, but, you know, um, so if we were to use them in research, we need to make sure that they're clean and we need to identify the specific particle types. And that's like a pretty big thing. Um, that we know because we need to identify specific polymer types, but in a more practical sense, um, you know, reusing fibers really, um, I think there's a lot of people that have pushed to kind of um, amalgamate them into, um, especially with the plastic fibers, is to amalgamate them into like a ball or some sort of pellets and then use those to make um, other products. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult with these kind of things because you often get a mix of different plastic types when you um, wash, say, uh, your laundry. You know, you're not strictly wearing all polyethylene or you're not strictly all wearing like nylon, 
right? So when we collect these fibers, it's difficult to like amalgamate them into like one thing if they're made from different materials. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the question, Zoe. I'll just add that definitely at CP3, once Miguel joined our team, that's something that we're trying to also find a solution for. So trying to change our microplastics that we collect from our shredding process to research grade microplastics, or kind of find different ways that we can transform it into other products. Um, so if anyone's also interested in joining that project, feel free to email us or send us a message on social media and you can definitely uh, work for that specific issue. Um, is there any other questions from the, any of the audience? Okay, in that case, I'll ask one of my questions, which is in terms of the materials you, you sort of mentioned quickly, like to avoid nylon and polyester and things like that, which I think most of our clothing is really made out of, right? When I look at my tag of the shirt I'm wearing right now, there was at least five materials. Is there any, you know, specific brands that we should avoid. You mentioned the materials that we should avoid, but there's any brands that maybe um, use more of these materials than others. I'm assuming anything fast fashion would be something to avoid automatically. Um, but I don't know if you have, you know, more of a, uh, a solution to where we should be buying our clothes that are more environmentally friendly. Um, um, go, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Like for sure, secondhand clothing can be like good because like the clothing has been produced and used and just not have gone in a landfill. So you're like um, promoting like just not sending clothing to a landfill. And uh, what did you want to add, Miguel? Yeah, so I think you made a good point there about um, fast fashion and how they typically um, use materials that... Um, are first of all easy to handle or easy to work with. So you, you know your plastic fibers. So you typically find those in um, bigger industries. Um, but the other thing that you should think of is when you're buying these products um, is their source. So we obviously want to get clothing from um, local sources as, as much as possible. Um, and then aside, other than that, like it's it really matters um what type of fiber it is so you mentioned you know that it's nylon and things that we should avoid yes and i think that's a lot of what we can do really like for the specific brands it doesn't matter too much what the brands are obviously if they're you know outsourcing their labor from a lesser privileged country that's a different issue altogether and you know fair trade work is a whole different issue um, but in terms of like the microfibers, like as long as you know what kind of fiber it is, um, you know, one that's made by one company versus another that's um, kind of more well known, it doesn't really matter. It's the same, it's the same plastic, right? Yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you for answering. We have another question in the chat from Meredith, which is how do you tell the difference between clothing that is less processed versus more processed with dyes and additives and things like that? Is there any way to know uh, sort of, you know, by looking at it or just, you know, they, we have to trust the label? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough, right? So this is something that they can like very easily lie to us about. So that's kind of when this, um, sort of trust between consumer and uh, producer um, it really needs to be built so by there's no real way the short answer is there's no real way for you to tell based on just like looking at it to see if it's processed with more dyes and additives um, so if it says 100% cotton you know you can they can tell you that it's sustainably manufactured and that it you know, has very little additives, but um, there's no way for you to know other than like, um, you know, taking their word for it. Obviously there's um, ways um, in, in a lab setting to identify these additives and their presence in the fibers, but a normal human being wouldn't necessarily have access to these kind of like um, uh, analytic things to find out. So I think that's a good, point to bring up is um, because we really need to hold our businesses accountable for these kinds of things, right? So if they're consistently lying to us about these things, then maybe we shouldn't buy from them anymore, is my take. 
I completely agree. And we can also make this with just regular plastic products, not even clothes. Most of our product pl plastic products are not labeled properly, or you don't also know what kind of additives are in there. Um, and this includes a lot of a lot of different issues. So I'm a huge advocate also for manufacturer's responsibility for letting the consumer know how to recycle it, what's it made out of. Um, these are things that a lot of a lot of manufacturers aren't currently doing, which is an issue. Yeah, for sure. Is there any other questions? Um, okay, so I'll ask one more then, which is more related to your research, Miguel, and sort of what you're trying to achieve uh, and what you see kind of it going towards in the future, any type of new developments of uh, if this is gonna help, you know, maybe not transform how clothing are made, but show a little bit more of how this impacts uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, like you're kind of scaring us of what this all means, but it's not really scary. Knowledge is power, really. So how do you see your research impacting um, how we collect or how we are consuming our marine life, you know, to avoid microplastics? Or what do you what do you feel that it will impact us with? I think in the overall grand scheme of things, um, I think a big part of it is generating this um awareness of this issue. Um, so I'm very involved in like scientific communication. And I think that's a pretty big step um, into creating, as Emily mentioned, this culture of sustainability. And once we're aware of these issues, you know, we're more willing to put people in power that actually care about these um, uh, issues. And, um, you know, we're more willing to support policies that protect our marine life from these problems. Um, because, you know, if you don't know that they're actually bad for them, you know, like I think a lot of people think that plastics um, are sort of inert and kind of don't really have a negative impact. And so um, by understanding how it can affect these organisms and how it can mess up their environment and how it can get eventually to um, affect our human societies, I think we're more capable of making correct, more informed decisions as to um, what type of stuff we buy, who we put in power, what kind of policies we put in, in place, um, that kind of stuff. That's really great. And uh, I see that you put the process a bit of us, how, of how we're gonna collect it. Um, I don't know if you wanna elaborate more on the sieve yeah. process and the different sizes of microplastics we're gonna collect. Um, but if anyone else has any other questions, or free to, to interrupt and ask away as well. Or how like the sieving process works, like how is that done exactly? How like the... Oh um, yeah, so this, the sieving process is actually really cool. So um, follow us on Instagram, you'll know everything about it. Um, so we first shred, the thing that I don't show here is our humongous shredding machine, which is currently in the downtown campus. Um, so we create these like raw materials and then we put them into, um, they're usually used for sediment um, processing. So essentially um, it's a bunch of, think of like a strainer, like a pasta strainer, but with like much smaller holes. And so you stack multiple of those with known um, sizes of the holes of each sieve. And you just put your raw materials on top and then you shake it vigorous, like vigorously. And by vigorously, I mean vigorously. Um, we actually had a, uh, another researcher from the same floor when we were doing this complain that they can hear our machine from down the hall when all of our doors were closed. But anyway, so you put it on top and then you shake it vigorously and then it's eventually um, separated by size because only the, you know, the right size will go through each, uh, each sieve and each hole um, on the mesh. And so once we have those, we typically, this one I believe is 75 microns, which is um, if you look at um, your fingernails, you know, that white part on it, I forget what it's called, but that's kind of about um, half the size of that white part on your fingernail. Um, but it looks like dust right here. And when you bring it into a microscope, it kind of looks uh, more plasticky. And so that's kind of how the sieving process works. And I will add that the, the vigorous shaking is from like another machine that all the sieves are stacked and it's just using <laughs> shaking the sieves all together. And yes, it was a very loud process. 
And can you see the, the different shapes of these uh, microplastics in a, the telescope? Yeah, yeah, for sure. The microscope, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, the, the issue that we've had is, so we've compared it to the ones that we buy um, and use for the research. And, uh, you know, when we use things for uh, research, we typically buy them in known um, shapes and that's kind of where the difference lies is when we create these microplastics from um, raw materials we tend to get irregular shapes um, and most of the time um, irregular configurations um, so you could have if you think of a sieve right it could be that your particle is long but thin but it can still pass through the sieve because the thinnest part can still go through it and so that's kind of a big issue because in terms of volume, you know, we're getting different things um, with that. But yeah, you do get the different shapes here. And that's sort of what you see in the image that you're sharing as well. They're kind of jaggedy and not, not perfect. Um, so yeah, so this is part of the what we're doing with microplastics at CP3. Like I said, if you're interested in, in learning more, helping us come up with a new process to collect, but also uh, process and transform these microplastics, that's what Miguel is doing with CP3 now. Um, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank both of you for the wonderful presentation today. I definitely learned a lot. I've added our Instagram accounts, both CP3 as well as the Office of Sustainability to the chat, as well as our websites. Um, and I'll just point out that CP3 is currently recruiting for our team. So I've added that recruitment form as well to the chat. If any of you are interested in joining, um, please fill out the form and we can contact you soon. Thank you again so much, everyone who participated and attended today. Um, yeah, can't wait to, uh, to hear more about what you'll, you'll, you'll accomplish in your research. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Bye, everyone.